your outline with you. We can get started. One more thing. Good. We're going to open in a word of prayer, and then we will continue dealing with what I call a parenthesis between two major realities in the apocalypse. One climaxing a the end of an age that is picked up in chapter 19 verses 1 through 9 actually. We'll be getting back there probably week after ne next where we will be preaching through the book of the Revelation. I'm just really trying to cultivate the soil a little bit more because it's it's a lot between chapter 19 and 22. There's a lot to talk about, and I really do want to make sure that it's uh, digestible. So I want to emphasize that verse 10, Revelation 19:10, is a parenthesis, a pause, with symbolic significance that really amounts to making sure that the object of your worship is right. It's not so much a warning as it is a kind of call to reevaluate before going forward. So that's really the essence of that exhortation. We're going to be working through it again. You're, you're dealing with fundamentals here in Revelation 19.10, but fundamentals, I think, that people still don't always altogether grasp. So because verse 10 has at least four clauses in it, we got a lot to work with, but we did make a good run at it on Tuesday. So I'm going to be reiterating some things today, and then we will be able to press into hopefully points two and three. When you are talking about worship, you're talking about a big subject, simple but big. And then when you're talking about worshiping God, you're actually talking about a subject too big to limit. So you have to be humble about that one. The term theos or uh, Elohim in the Hebrew, theos in the New Testament, Elohim in the Old Testament. And, and we have the benefit of having both testaments, even though we operate out of the what? New Testament. So the Christian in the New Testament age builds his theology historically. And, and that's really important. I'm, I'm actually getting back into biblical theology as I'm opening up with you, but I just want you to get it because I, I so want us at Grace to be people that actually are aware of what we're doing. So I remember a couple years ago when I had the privilege of teaching the women's theology class, which they're hankering for that again. Uh, I hope we can do it. I hope we can start and do a small segment. I got a series on Mary and Martha that I really want to do. Uh, but the last series we did was on the Trinity. I love that. How many of you ladies were in my Trinity class? Was that a good class? Right. And, and, and I stumbled across a really good book that one of my pastor friends that I grew up with, he, he's, that's, his name is Joe Jackowitz. Please keep him in your prayer. He's on a second bout of leukemia, which it's not looking good. And he's my age. He's a peer of mine. And, and, and he's not looking good. Um, I should read this letter. I'll do it next week. He is such uh, a model of a believer in the midst of suffering. And I really want to hear, I want you to hear, I mean, he, he dealt with it magnificently last time. Uh, and, you know, they had to almost kill him in order to save him because that's what chemo is. And this time around, his attitude is just sterling as well. And we need to hear these kind of testimonies where people are in their ship and their ship is filling up with water. Because a lot of us are, we, we, you know, the waves are doing this, okay? That's all they're doing for some of us. 
others of us, that, that boat is filling up with water and the front end is going down and they have to believe that God cares, right? Um, but he, 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 he has always loved doing book publishing and we got a book by an elder, I forget his name now, German guy, and he is, it does such a simple job in clarifying the Trinity in basic elementary forms. Uh, and I thought, this is great because most of the time, the paradoxical nature of the Trinity causes people to stumble. I'm saying that because we're going to touch on it a little bit tonight. Um, but uh, I have enjoyed the women's theology class because it has always been super well attended and, and I could push the parameters of their mind too, which I knew years ago that women could capacitate theology at levels equivalent to men um, as well, even though they have to apply it differently. And they hunger for that as, as well. Um, so grace is one of these places where if you're serious about God, you can actually get a good theological education. Um, and uh, so that's what I'm doing here right now while I'm talking to you. Verse 10 has a lot to say. I'm open in prayer, then we're going to just kind of go in it. I want to revisit a fundamental that we talked about Tuesday, then we can see where we can, where we can go. Father, thank you for your mercy and your kindness to us tonight. Thank you for your providence and watching over us and uh, guiding us into uh, physical proximity with each other and the joy of being in the presence by your spirit, Coram Deo, and we know you are present because our minds are now already being recalibrated and our hearts and affections are being steered towards you as the object of our meditation and thought and cogitation. And so the preparation of the heart in man, according to your word, and the answer of the tongue, you provide both. So provide our hearts and provide the tongue where you can communicate with us these fundamentals so that we don't lose our way particularly when the storms come again for any of us. We're asking your mercy upon the whole body of Christ. We're praying your healing providence and purpose on our brother Joe and his family who is going through it for the second time, along with all the saints around the world who are going through so much. Uh, we are so glad that they can bear the manifestation of Christ in them, the hope of glory, and so speak from a position of triumph in the, even in the midst of their suffering. May we be able to do that should that be our assignment. So we come to you on the grounds of Christ's blood and righteousness, our cleansing and our standing, which is in him. Help us to see him now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read it again, verse 10 of Revelation chapter 19, and then we're going to move into the imperative that the angel gave us because we worked through worship, I think, on Tuesday significantly enough, the importance of worship, the importance of bowing down. Now we want to deal with the object of our worship. So we read in verse 10 these words, I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, remember what I said last time, it's not see, thou do it not, but see, keep your eyes open, maintain your vision, maintain your vision. I am thy fellow servant and of your brethren. And what we have in common is that we both hold the testimony of Jesus. That's our job. And because of that, I'm going to tell you to redirect your worship to where it belongs. Here is the second imperative, worship God. That's what we're working through tonight. That's what we're dealing with tonight. The second imperative. First imperative, keep your eyes open. Second imperative, worship God. A beautiful admonition, especially since uh, this had to be said to uh, John twice. He had to hear this again over in the book of Revelation chapter 22 as well. Over in Revelation 22, if you look at it, verse 9, notice what it says. You'll see that under our second point. But Revelation 22, 9, which I thought was always interesting, but here it is in the close of the book. Then said he unto me, see again, keep your eyes open, for I am of thy fellow servants and of thy brethren, the prophets. This time he says, and them which what? Keep the sayings of this book. So last time it was who hold the testimony of Jesus. That's one tandem. And keep the sayings of this book. Now he gives the imperative again, which is what? 
worship God. Right. So I, I love how so people don't always understand why God would repeat things with slight modifications in the world of scholarship in textual criticism. The higher critics would argue that these are interpolations or, or uh, insertions into the text or ridiculous tautological expressions, which would imply that somebody, some scribe was just, you know, put it on, 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 on stupid and, and did the same thing twice. No, no. I told you. Now, there are areas in the scriptures on a textual level that we have to negotiate, but I told you, just because the scriptures say the same thing twice only means that you and I are slow. That's all that means. And daddy loves us enough to say it twice. And I could give you a, a thousand examples, but in this one here, here's the reason why you and I would be told to keep your eyes open and worship God is because as we are moving towards the close of an age, and that's really where we're going when we pick back up in verse 11. As we move towards the, the close of an age, the storms are so violent, the trials are so immense, the uh, foundation is shaking so bad that the, uh, the, uh, the capacity to take your eyes off of God is easy. That really is the case. That really, really is the case. So I'm, what we're doing tonight is a parenthetical study. Okay, I told you that. Verse 10 is a parenthetical because it's just a break between a, a, a prolific worship for the downfall of the beast and then an explanation as to how that beast was destroyed in verses 11 following. So after John is told to, you know, keep your head on straight, the heavens are going to open up for John. And then we're going to be entering into another series of visions that are going to take us all the way into the new Jerusalem paradigm. That language is going to be challenging, but edifying if we take our time and are careful. So the curtains haven't opened yet. We have heard the voice. Worship God. So in this verse, the emphasis is on keeping God's sayings. That would speak to the literal word of God, the Torah. Uh, and in this context, historically, it would be probably all of the New Testament by now. If you held to, which I am debating uh, to what is called an early New Testament uh, consummation, the, the totality of scripture being completed in terms of the New Testament before the temple was destroyed in AD 70. Or even if you held to a late date of uh, 80, 90, or 100, the vast majority of the New Testament is finished. So you have both the Old Testament and the New Testament for the first century saints. So how do we worship God? We worship God through his word. That's going to be the st stabilizing factor. Even though Christ is the, he is the pers personification of God's revelation. He is the personification of God's revelation. The way we know Christ is through his word. All right. So the father is known through the son and the son is known through his word. But his word has to be revealed to us by yet a third person who is what? The Holy Spirit, who is said to be the author of scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so there is a Trinitarian collaboration in your and my ability to worship God. I love this. You, you can mark this. Your, the primary object of your worship is the Father. But that worship is never individuated in any kind of divisive sense apart from the Son. You never think about worshiping the Father and not worshiping the Son. Does that make sense? Right. It's impossible to worship someone for whom it requires a mediator to reveal him to you, which is the second person. So when you hear the imperative worship, that's the verb, God, that's the object. New Testament Christians know this, that if I'm going to be able to do that successfully, it's going to have to be first by his spirit. Secondly, through Jesus and in a very instrumental way by the word of God. 
So Revelation 22.9 and Revelation 22.10 are not contradictory, although they are different. They are tandems. Does that make sense? This is how you harmonize scripture. As much as the angel is saying fundamentally the same thing, he is also altering what he says by reinforcing another truth that is critical to the apocalypse. And that is your Bible is consummated in terms of inscripturated authority with the end of the apocalypse. So that in Revelation 22, where verse nine, we just read about the keeping of the sayings of this book. In verse 18 and 19, he tells us if we add to this book, we're in trouble. If we take away from this book, we're in trouble too. We have to keep the book as the grounds of our absolute authority for knowing Christ and therefore knowing the Father by him. And so that is really an important element in the worship of God that I just want to put out as a caveat. There are people who are listening who will understand what I mean that are asking me how do we understand that imperative. We understand that imperative fundamentally the Father is the object. The Son is the means of the revelation of the Father. The Spirit is the means of the revelation of the Son. And the Word of God is that instrumental codification of who God is by which we know him certainly. It is the more sure word of prophecy. Like you don't take this book and throw it away and just say, Holy Spirit, reveal Jesus to me. The Holy Spirit has revealed him to us in the codification of a book that requires us opening it and reading it or at least hearing it communicated and the Spirit of God doing something for us internally by which we go, aha, that makes sense. All right. So now under point number one, we were dealing with the subject of um, the imperative of worship in heaven. Now, I really pressed home after dealing with worship itself. Sub point a in reverence of his what his name. And last uh, Tuesday, I dealt with the term I told you in the uh, in the Old Testament. The term Hashem means what the name, right? The name. That's the Old Testament. And who is the name of the Lord? in the New Testament reveal, right, it is Jesus. And we will see this shortly, but I wanna take you through some basics around that term, because again, in Christianity, what we do is we have nomenclature, terminology, uh, phraseology that's not always uh, understood, it's often assumed. Whenever you use the term, the name of, the name of, you are dealing with at least four things, and we can start off First of all, with titles, we talked about that. The title, that's a title. But the title actually is leading us to first an identity. When we talk about a name, we are talking about an identity, an identity. The second, that we, second thing we're doing when we talk about a name is we're talking about an authority and authority. I'm gonna affirm these with you, although we have done this before, in our study around the, um, the Trinity, particularly uh, Matthew 28, verse 19, if you will pull that up. Um, and after authority, what we are uh, dealing with when we talk about the name is the concept of character. Character, and we'll see this here a little bit too. Uh, and, and then finally, uh, the concept of reputation. And all of these are gonna be important uh, in relationship to our present assignment on Sunday, and, and they'll come back to you in a moment. Um, because every believer has an identity. Every believer also has a character. Every believer has a what? Reputation, and every believer has an authority. You do. Now, when you take all four of those into view, they basically make up who you are. If someone knows you, they know the sphere of your influence. They know your role. They also know your character. Uh, and they know, um, they know your reputation. Character and reputation is slightly different. I can also talk about attributes, and I'll do that here in a moment with God because this is the beauty of doing what it's called right now. This here is theology proper, what we're doing now. Studying God is theology proper. Attributes are slightly different than character. I do want to make sure you understand that, although they overlap with a lot of people. So when we talk about Hashem, our worshiping God, 
worshiping the name of God in terms of his identity. Here's a way to look at it. Isaiah 42 verse 8. I'm just going to share a few verses to lay it down. This one would kind of lay out the basic placard that God lays out. And here's what he says about who he is. He says in Isaiah 42, 8, I am what? The Lord. That's Yahweh, Jehovah, or literally in the Hebrew, Hebrew Yahweh, 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 Yahweh. I am Yahweh. That is my what? There it is. Do you see it? Now watch what he does. This, this is called, again, an explanation of the statement. An ex exegetical. He did actually say something about who he is. He said, I am the Lord. Now, ego ami is making a self-indexing about yourself. I am. That's who I am. So the I am's in the gospel of John from the I am the resurrection. I am the life. I am the bread. All of those underscore Jesus owning identity with God. I am. It's indexing. But and, and therefore one is called self-identification. You and I do that, too, don't we? We have the right to go, I am who I am. I am Jesse with a whole list of other characteristics, attributes, um, spheres of authority and reputation. And if one knows me, they can determine who I am by those things. They don't know me by my mere uh, proper name, Jesse. There are millions of Jesses on planet Earth. That's not how you know me. That's merely a proper name. Until you press into all these other aspects of my identity, you don't know me. And a person might know Yahweh by name as a title, but not know him at all. Conversely, you might know that Jesus is the New Testament equivalent to the Old Testament Yahweh and still not know Jesus at all. The demons know Jesus, but they don't. And the Bible is clear. There's a whole slew of people who will meet the calamitous rejection of Christ who used his name over and over and over again. And he'll say, I never knew you. So just because you know a person's title doesn't mean you know that person comprehensively. And to worship someone, you have to know more than the title of their name. You guys understand what I'm saying. And so here we are going to work through this. Here's how God says it to us. I am the Lord. That's my name. And my glory. There we go. Now we're moving into authority, spheres of authority. We're moving into character and attributes. And we're moving into what? That's what glory means. Glory is the emanation of who you are and all of your powers to exhibit it. Everybody has a glory. And so God says, I am the Lord, Yahweh, that is my name. In my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. And so here God places a prohibition upon you and I taking his attributes, characteristics, reputation, and authority and investing it somewhere else. This is a great countertext to John chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 19, 10. Worship God. Worship God. So there's another, uh, another verse I want you to look at relative to authority. Isaiah chapter 45, verses 5 through 7. This has to do with authority. And authority has to do with sphere of influence. The sphere of influence will also be an aspect of uh, entitlement or designation relative to uh, the term name. For instance, when a police officer pulls you over, they will tell you to stop in the name or authority of the law. So the law possesses a sphere of authority. I am a police officer invested with the authority to stop you and to actually investigate whether or not you're walking in conformity with God's law. Notice what he says. I am the Lord. That is a fundamental. All through scripture, the Lord is a reality for us. Yahweh in the Old Testament, Kyrios in the New Testament, personified in his son, Jesus Christ. We'll see that shortly. I am the Lord. And there is none else. Notice what he does. He establishes exclusivity. And there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded you, though you did not know me. Now he's moving into 
his, watch this now, his reputation. I girded you even before you knew me. I was dealing with you. I was addressing your life. Now watch what he says in verse 6. Verse 6, please. That they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. And what he does in reiterating his name and his authority is that God raised us up to help his reputation be spread. You guys got that? To help his reputation be spread. That they may know me. Who? Other people. How are they going to know me? Through you. He said, I girded you up. I am the Lord. Besides me, there is no other God. I'm the one girded you up. I brought you into being. I established you that they may know me from the rising of the sun and from the, from the west, that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. This is so important relative to you and me having a name. God has chosen to manifest his glory through his people. We'll see that shortly. Verse 7. I said 45, 7. I form the light. I create darkness. I make peace. I create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. You see what he's doing? Setting forth his reputation. Oh, you the one who did all this? Yes, that's me. <laughs> that's me. I'm the one who did that. Something else shortly just to, to add to it, even though I, Isaiah 45 is just a, a passage that you just have to pour yourself into. Verse 22 and 23. You're going to hear something very similar to a New Testament text, which we'll go to in our second point. This again refers to the sphere of his authority and reputation. And do what? Be ye saved. All ye ends of the earth. That's the scope of his appeal now. To everybody, if you're going to be saved, you got to look to me. For I am Elohim and there is none else. Once again, exclusivity. So worshiping God requires submitting to the imperative to look. Remember I told you the angel said what? Look, keep seeing. Worship God and there's none else. Now notice what verse 23 says. Here is the expansion of his, his authority. I have sworn by my what? Why? Because he has no greater one to swear by. He's, he's the highest authority. That's it. This is, once you hit God, that's it. No, no other authority over him. This is important, too, when you understand the law of first causes in everything. So, like, people will ask us about, you know, God's will and God's rights and God's prerogatives. This is where the idea of absolute autocratic authority uh, begins and ends. Absolute uh, autocratic authority means that God has the intrinsic right to do what he does, and because he does it, it's right. Like he does not have to justify what he does by calling witness to something else to affirm his right to do what he does. Now he does do it, but that's going from the greater to the lesser. He does not depend upon it for the integrity of who he is or what he does. He simply brings other people into the courtroom to bear record with who he is in order to establish the law out of the mouth of what? Two or three witnesses, let every word be established. By the way, child of God, he saved you for you to do that about him. Child of God, he saved you for you to do that about him. I, I, I am fairly certain that most of you are in, in a healthy way understanding the importance of being a child of God, particularly on a judicial level because of the way we preach and teach. That as a witness for God, you are called to stand before men and bear record of his reality. And then to bear record of his identity and bear record of his character, his attributes, his reputation and his authority. Right. You, that's what you and I are called to. It's a phenomenal thing, but it's a blessing as well. So just understand that as you and I are looking at these characteristics in terms of God's identity, He's actually drawing you and I into the controversy of who he is because he's controversial to his whole fallen creation relative to it being mankind. So he says here, I have sworn by myself and the word is going out of my mouth. Can we personify that? Has Jesus gone forth out of the mouth of the father? Absolutely. 
And he's gone forth in what kind of characteristic? Righteousness. Righteousness. And shall not return that unto me every knee shall what? And every tongue shall. Right. Does that sound like a New Testament verse? That conflates the authority of Yahweh with the authority of Jesus. Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 through 11. Right. God has given him, an, uh, given him a name above every name that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow. So now watch this. And we already know, God says there's only one God, him only shall you worship, serve, bow down to. No other God shall you bow down to. But we bow down to Jesus, which makes Jesus what? Absolutely. Absolutely. So even though the Father is conferring upon the Son authority as the grounds upon which we bow down and venerate, it's not that somehow God is losing his authority. He's simply sharing his authority with him who is God also. You guys understand that. And that's really an important concept because people will argue about it. But this is another text underscoring uh, God's authority and Christ's authority. We could go all the way through the Gospel of John and defend the authority of the Son in relationship to the Father to let men and women know that if you don't bow to the Son, you haven't bowed to the Father. You guys do know that, right? And so now we go to the third thing, which I call characteristics and attributes are slightly different, but for time's sake, I'll, I'll let them be. Uh, uh, attributes for me are things that are commonly shared among the species um, that is in view. Attributes commonly shared among the species that's in view. For, for instance, you and I are all human beings. We have particular attributes in common. We're all sinners. We're all mortal. We're all uh, uh, men and women with capacities. And, um, and then we move from those attributes that we care, uh, that we share in common to particular characteristics. And in those particular characteristics, watch this, while we share them, we don't share them equally. And because we don't share them equally, we are equal, but not the same. We are individuated. Does that make sense? Right. So we will have characteristics common to each other, but they will take on different individual proportions that will make up your unique personality. I'll be talking about that on Sunday. Because like, watch this. This is important. It's important to know that you are you, ego I me, is the reverse of that. Like I am me and you are you. And like God, there is no one in the universe like you but you. Now there are a lot of people that are like you and there are a lot of people that are close and more similar to you than other people. But there's something distinctly different about you than even that other person or groups of other persons for whom many of us being nearsighted might swear that you and they are the same person. Am I making some sense? I jumped on a plane a hundred years ago, went to Africa, jumped off that plane in Nigeria, started walking the streets, and I said, I swear I'm in downtown Oakland. <laughs> All these people looked like the people I grew up. They followed me to Nigeria until they opened their mouths. And then what were common characteristics were now distinguished by unique characteristics that made them different than me. While our mouths were shut, we were all just a bunch of black folk. Once they opened their mouth, I realized I was the foreigner, <laughs> right? So what are we doing now? We are pressing more deeply into their identity. And it's the same way when it comes to God. So he has attributes that we don't have, and he has characteristics that we share. Verse, uh, I think that's the final verse. Um, so now moving to my third uh, point, I, I like to talk about the name of God in terms of his character. Well, because the Bible does too. Uh, Exodus 34, verse 5 and 6. Now, I just want you to mark the phrase, the name, and then what God does. You've heard this before, but it's important for you to see. Because now Moses is getting ready to know God better himself. Remember, Jesus said, and this is eternal life, that they might what? No. Know you. Know you. On a level of friendship and relationship that increases with time. Increases. 
So Moses had known God for about a year and two, three months. For a whole year, he got to hang out with God while God was kicking butt in Egypt. It was a very business oriented relationship by which Moses was able to see a number of God's authoritative attributes. But they were at a distance because he was dealing with social, political, spiritual issues by which Moses learned something about God, particularly his faithful covenant keeping purposes to other people he had never met, though he was related to them, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But remember what Moses said when he came into the dilemma of God executing judgment on a significant portion of his own people for worshiping idols. He said, show me your what? That's right. Really what Moses was saying is, I need to know you better. That's what you got to get out of this. My present perception and knowledge of you is inadequate to the crisis I'm in. I'm in a crisis. And the solution to my crisis is knowing you better. And God already knew that, didn't he? And God knows that about you and me. He knows that for you and I to be able to handle the trials that we go through, we got to get to know God better. Because to the degree that we get to know him better, we can trust him more. When we have a greater understanding of what he's doing, we have a greater understanding of what's happening. This is what Jesus meant when he says, and this is eternal life. Because eternal life is not merely a matter of duration, but quality. It's a qualitative thing. And so here's what God does for Moses. He says, I'm going to show you my glory. And how does he do it? He does it by sending the visible Yahweh. Now, who is visible Yahweh? Y'all should know by now. Jesus. Because the Father is what? Invisible Invisible, unapproachable, ineffable, but he manifests himself through his son, right? So who's coming down from heaven? Jesus comes down a lot. I love it, don't you? Come down, Lord, because I'm in trouble. Right, no, so this is a beautiful thing because it is an aspect of his character that he would come down. Isaiah 57, 15, don't pull it up, but I just want you to remember, I am the high and lofty God. I sit on the circuit of the universe. I feel heaven and earth, and I condescend to hang out with contrite men and women and, and those who are humble to revive their spirits. God loves coming down for needy people. He does. Moses was needy. God came down in the person of his son. Now watch what he does. He says, and the Lord descended in the cloud. And here's our anthropomorphic signal that we're dealing with the second person. And stood with him there. Y'all got that? Anthropomorphisms, meaning we're dealing with a personified manifestation of an infinite being who has no form, shape, and cannot be confined by space or time. The infinite God now shows up in the finitude of humanity. He has to be what we call the pre-incarnate Christ. Lo, I what? In the volume of the book is written of the who? So Jesus is showing up a lot in the Old Testament if you're careful to look for him. The, Lord, the son's been doing a lot of work for daddy, I'm just telling you. And this is why daddy loves him. Because what he does also is a model for us. Serving God is a privilege. Serving God is a privilege. You want me to do something, Lord, just give me an assignment. And that's what the son is demonstrating. The Lord's servant is struggling and the father says to the son, go help him understand who I am. This is why Jesus says, I am the what? Way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by the Son. If you've seen me, what? You've seen the Father. You guys are tying the knots, right? This is the beauty of the centrality of the gospel in the person of Christ. We, Christ makes the Father accessible to us. Now watch this. Watch this. And he stood with him there and he began to preach the what? There it is. Do you see that? He preached the name of the Lord. That's where we are right now in our subject, in our study. Right. So like if you and I don't know God's name, we don't know his identity. 
if we don't know his authority, if we don't know his attributes, characteristics, and reputation, it means we don't know him. Again, it doesn't mean that we can't know the name Yahweh or the name Jesus, but the things that pour into that name is what it means to know him. And the sermon that Christ preaches here, because he is the quintessential preacher, to Moses is beautiful. Look at what we look at in verse 6 and 7 concerning the attributes and characteristics. And I call these characteristics and I'll distinguish that in a moment. And the Lord did what? So he came down and he walked past Moses. Can y'all get that? See, that's why I walk on the stage when I'm preaching. Just that. These are anthropomorphic things. Anthropomorphic things. It's a beautiful, really, uh, inference to... God lips, lisping, lisping is a, uh, a term that means condescending to meet us at our baby states. He comes so close, he'll pass by us. He comes so close. And Jesus passed by. And the blind man said, son of David, son of David. Do you all remember? So here we go again, Jesus passing by. The only reason you and I are saved because Jesus passed by. You do know that, right? The only reason we're saved because Jesus passed by. And you know what I love about this? If you just if you just need to uh, you need to be kind of cultivated here. If you just say, "Lord, show me your glory," he'll pass by you. If you wait, he will. If you wait, he will. If you wait, he will. Right? Because it's his nature to manifest his glory. I've been saying this ever since I've been saved in preaching. The only reason people won't see God's glory is because they don't want to. God is light. God is light. You know what that means? By nature, he is glorious. Light wants to shine. It's just waiting for an opportunity. Let me in. Right. How obstinate and rebellious are we to hate the light? Right? Now notice what he says. And the Lord passed by him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim. What is he? merciful, gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. These are characteristics. These are characteristics. These explain to us his character. Is this the way God is? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. This is his character. This should help you and me also define our providences better. The providence of our circumstances better. The character of God. Because I think we can be going through things and <clears throat> mischaracterize God. Right? And if we mischaracterize God, we'll mischaracterize the, his providence in our life. But if we get his character right, we can actually get the event right. Verse 7. Notice what he says. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. See, now this is the side of his mercy, I told you. There are two major prongs of God's character or attributes that he shows. Mercy and what? Justice. justice. Now we're getting ready to look at the justice side, aren't we? Notice what it says. And that will by no means clear the guilty. Nobody's getting away with sin. He's a just God. So like that first category of list deals with his attributes and disposition of dealing with sinners in their plight. But sinners will not get away with their disobedience with God. That's what we mean by the tandem of mercy and justice. Notice what he says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. Watch this. Moses go, got it. <laughs> That's why you did what you did. That's why you killed off thousands of them. That's why you did what you did. Here it is. Ready? He showed mercy. They rejected it. He showed justice. Y'all got that? He showed mercy for a whole year. We talked about this as we were unpacking the revelation. Every time God poured a judgment upon Israel, I mean upon Egypt, he protected Israel. Every judgment protected Israel and then brought them out, and then provided for them, 
And then they get two months into the wilderness and act like God doesn't exist. And then on top of that, start a treasonous rebellion and create two idol gods. That was no small rebellion. And so God says, oh, they have to know that I punish sin. They have to know it. So remember what I was saying, the, what, what the world will often ask us as Christians, and particularly people that struggle with theology, is what is God up to in our world? He's up to two things, manifesting the glory of his mercy and his justice. Two things. Whether we want to accept that or not, that's the way really reality is held in balance. The, the evils that go on in our world are a consequence of our sinfulness by which God allows those evils to punish us with the aim of some of us recognizing that the reason those evils have come upon us is because of our sinfulness and that compels us to sue God for mercy which he shows in saving us from our sins and that's the whole narrative of fallen humanity until he comes back again. Even though they don't want to hear that story, we still tell it to them. Right? This is the best frame we can put on this crazy mess we're going through. God is showing his mercy and he's showing his justice. And if you don't like it, I don't think you can find any other game theory that will actually get you to the right place. And so that is the... Uh, the uh, character and attribute element. One more I want to deal with, and that's the reputation, even though I've already done that. Isaiah 43, verse 15 and 16. Isaiah 43, 15 and 16. Then I want to move on. Notice what God says here, because he does it a lot in the Old Testament. I'll probably have to think that through a little bit. God says it a lot. I am the Lord. And then he adds to it what is necessary. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your what? It's a beautiful concept. I want you to capture, too, that second line, your holy one. That has to do with God's impeccableness and his exclusivity. That means there is none like him. And the uh, aggregate whole of all of his qualities are holy. Theologically, uh, this concept would refer to God not being able to be divided in any of his attributes, that they are all the same, equally holy in their summation of who God is. The only reason I say that is because you and I by nature are not like we are not holy by nature in any sense of the word. We are only holy by new nature and we're only holy by position. We're not holy by nature because you and I are constantly dealing with intrinsic division. Like holiness means that there is no conflict in you whatsoever. That just wipes out my whole class right here, including the teacher. <laughs> we are a bunch of conflicted entities. So holiness means that all of your attributes are working at optimum level in perfect harmony with each other without the slightest friction. Y'all don't know what that means. Don't even act like you do. <laughs> we don't know what that means because we're constantly devolving because of sin. Now, we would have known that had we not fallen in Adam and Eve because God made them upright. That means all of their working parts, their physiology, their psychology, their emotional disposition, their rational, cognitive, volitional skills were all operating in perfect harmony. What a beautiful thing. I mean, just what a beautiful thing to conceive. And we're not even conceiving it because our minds are already extremely limited by the governors of, of sinfulness. But think about the notion of being in complete integrity. Remember one of our... Uh, uh, year's themes was the integrity of the upright will uh, guide them right out of the Proverbs um, so God is integral so when you deal with integers and whole numbers and divided numbers you God is indivisible he's indivisible and 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 the believer again is positioned to be 
and that's the term teleos or perfect, whole, and we're called holy. Ours is positional and relational. It's not personal yet. We're going there in our study, though. This is the beautiful thing about getting to know the game of the name of God. So, like our discussion tonight about the name of God is really a dragnet that's swooping over all of you, bringing you closer to God right now. Why? Because in His name being revealed to us, He's affirming to us the relationship we have with Him. Here's the reason why He does not reveal Himself to people everywhere like this. Do you understand that? But to those whom he has designated to have a relationship, he reveals himself and drags us into the revelation of his name. So you and I spend a good portion of our worship and our meditation around knowing God. That's, that's really true. And it has enormous psychological, emotional, and practical benefits for us. Our health, health, health. Is dependent upon our knowing God. Our mental health, our emotional health, psychological health, our spiritual health, social health, our pragmatic health is dependent upon this, this, this ever growing encroachment of the name of God in our life for which we love what is taking place. Now, the economy of biblical exposition and sitting up under the word of God where our mind and our heart can be nurtured by God's presence through exposition is the way you and I are transformed into his image. Right? Does that make sense? Right. So this is what uh, God is saying to the nation of Israel. I just want to read a few verses because he's un un unfurling to them a remembrance of who they are in him. I am the Lord, your holy one, the creator of Israel. And we can identify that in the New Testament since as all of God's people, right? We are the Israel of God. You're who? So in a minute, we're going there because that king is going to show up in verse 11 of our text in Revelation 19. That king is about to appear in all the glory of his power as a king. Verse 16. Verse 16. Thus said the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters. You know what he's doing right now? preaching is he not he's preaching his reputation which the whole world knows as to how he delivered his people out of Egypt through the Red Sea how he delivers you and me out of a way that was no way at all out of impossible circumstances by which that event becomes a reputation that the world knows about God through us right that's really important. Verse 17, which brings forth the chariot and the horse and the army and the power. They shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinct and they are quenched as the toe. That's God preaching about the definite destruction of the foe of his people. The nation of Israel knows that they never had to deal with that Pharaoh or Egypt again. And the believer knows this in the finality of the redemption that's in Christ. This is equivalent to our sins being put away by the death of Christ on the cross. So that you and I never ever have to worry again of our sins rising up to take us and bring us back into captivity. Let the whole world know that God has put away our sins by the sacrifice of his son so that there is there for now what? Forever forever. And that's part of the web of, 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 of reputation, character, identity, authority in the Hashim or the name for which we are called to worship God. Worship God in order that you might know all this because all of this is going to bring you into the web of his reputation. You and I get brought into the web. In fact, the only reason I can do this now is because somebody else got brought into God's web and God gave them this revelation and they gave it to me. And now I'm giving it to you and you got to give it to somebody else. And we keep doing this because God keeps saving people. Does that make sense? Right. That's the name of the Lord. So under uh, point number one, the imperative of heaven is to worship God. We can only worship him if we know him. Sub point B and C, I can simply assert those because that's what we dealt with. We worship him in the reverence of his name. We worship him in the adoration of his attributes. That's what we've been working through. And we worship God in the celebration of his what? Work. 
Beautiful. Beautiful. We were there last week when we were preaching through the title, Where is Your What? And we were dealing with the metaphor of, of being on the seas. And this is how the psalmist puts it in Psalm 107. I just want to deal with a few brief verses to remind you that God's the one that creates these storms. And he just simply tells you and me the two words, what? Hold on. That's what he says. Hold on. And I want you to see what he does. This is beautiful. I want you to capture this because this is going to be edifying to you relative to what you may be going through now or what you will be going through in your next test. Uh, simply because you decided to go with him. You decided to go. Remember what Jesus said? Launch out. Let us go to the other side. So you decided to go with Jesus. That's what we're doing. We're rolling with Jesus. We're in the boat. We've been in the boat for a while. And the boat is a massive fisherman's boat. And we've been casting nets, drawing in sinners all along the way. I've been doing that for grace for the last 25 years. And we've all been working, collaborating together, casting out that net. And then we've got people on board working hither and yon, cleaning the deck and organizing the nets and dealing with the fish. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying in terms of the vision? Because that's what the gospel ministry is all about. But we do get hit with some challenges. Notice what it says over in verse 13. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he what? Saved them out of all their distresses. Now watch, watch how the narrative works. He brought them out of darkness and of the shadow of death and brake their bands asunder. And for that, what? All that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and the wonderful, his wonderful works to the children of men. Then he goes on with the narrative again, for he hath broken the gates of brass, cut the bars in sunder, and then he admonishes them for not being able to understand how good God is. Look at verse 19. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he does what again? Saves them out of their trust, uh, distress. He sent his word and healed them. Who is his word? Jesus healed them how? By the cross and delivered them from their destruction. Oh, there it is again. There's your refrain. It does it all through Psalm 107. What is the refrain? All oh, that men would praise the Lord for his wonderful works to the children of men. That's the refrain. That's what we do when we worship. We go, all oh, that men would praise the Lord with us for his wonderful works to the children of men. Notice what it says then over in verse 25. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, and he lifts up the waves thereof. Trials come from for God, for, for our sake, for God's glory. They come that way. We need to get a handle on that. They mount up to the heaven. They go down again to the depths. Our soul is melted because of trouble. Would you agree with that? It does that to us, doesn't it? Now, we don't want to have to go through that, but we must. So I want you to think about the metaphor of melting for a moment. So melting is the way that God dislodges us from undetected pride and self-confidence that, that occurs uh, imperceptibly over time when in the normalcy of our life, we're doing well. We're doing so well that we don't need God for a season. Health is good. I'm cute right about now. Yeah, all that. You, you, you know all that. I, I'm good. God just, you didn't push me and I'm coasting and I'm happy. And, and, and after a while, you're talking with confidence, but it's not with reverence. And you know in the back of your mind you really need to be keeping up with God. But you're on a roll. And you don't want to break this roll. You're good. And that's because the boat has been sailing on the glassy sea. And you think you headed all the way into the haven this way. And the next thing you hear... And then... And now all of a sudden you back at it again, disrupted and melting. 
The, uh, the comfort you can receive from that is Psalm 22. We won't go there. I told you, Jesus went through that. So your melting was his melting because he went through the same thing. It's beautiful language in Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you what? Forsaken me. And in the midst of that Psalm, he says, my soul melted within me because he went through the rigors of humility. In fact, humiliation was while God humbles you and me. He never humiliates us. Do you understand that? The humiliation part was taken on by Christ. God never shames you and me. He bore our shame. So Christ had to experience something in his humiliation that you and I will never know. We will never know the depths of God actually dealing with us according to our sins because he never has. That's Psalm 103, by the way. You do know it, right? He has never dealt with us according to our sins. You don't ever want him to do it. You don't. Look, it's bad enough for him to whip our butt because he loves us. We do not want God dealing with us according to our sins. In fact, if you are in Christ, he can't deal with you according to your sins. Do you understand that theologically? Do you understand that for him to deal with you according to your sin is double jeopardy? Because justice once satisfied cannot demand twice for sin that which has already been paid. That would be double jeopardy. If you've done your time in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and you've paid your debt, you're free. God can never requite that again. That's a beautiful thing. So what is he doing with all this painful stuff we're going through? Conforming us to the image of his son. See what I'm saying? He allows us to be partakers of his suffering while teaching you and I that he's not dealing with us according to our sins. Now, it's important to know that because we will almost always attribute him dealing with us according to our sins. He's not dealing with us according to our sins. He's dealing with us according to his purpose. His purpose is way past your sin. His purpose is way inside of his scheme with the son and the spirit of conforming you to Christ. Does that make sense? This is why Joseph could make it through the test to the throne. If anybody had a right to be upset, it was Joseph. But Joseph had a solid high view of God and a rich biblical theology that underscored the reality that what he was going through, God allowed it and God was with him in it. And what you and I have to learn how to see, this is my heart's desire for us at Grace, is to see God in what we're going through, particularly what we're going through now. Remember, see, see, keep your eyes open, see, worship God, to be able to see what we're going through, through the prism of seeing God, Carmdale, in present, in present in all the, the efforts that God puts into to let you and me know that he's with us, is to be privileged. Can you imagine what's going on in our world right now in this reset for people who don't know God? Can you imagine how disturbing and, 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 and alarming it is right now for them to be going through the things we're going through as a society? Now, again, you may be oblivious to the massive radical changes that are happening, which will be permanent. You may be oblivious to that. I'm not. And a lot of us are not. And we know that it's not even close to being over with. Not even close. So there are paradigm shifts that have occurred in humanity from the beginning of time. I've told you about reset after reset in our world. Have I not? Your Bible lays it out, has it not? That was an absolute massive reset in the days of Noah. You have to know the world changed in the days of Noah. For Lot, it was local, but it was a massive reset. When God came down and utterly obliterated Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around it and wiped out everything but Lot and his two daughters, and he was so unstable in that time because his eyes were not on Jehovah 
adequately and properly that he engaged in the residual sin of the culture that he was in. And reset occurred for national Israel. They couldn't handle it. God comes in, knocks on the door and says, let my people go. It's time. Time for a reset. He busts up Egypt, the greatest country in the world. And he brings out a million and a half people and they're going, what in the world is going on? Right? And they were discombobulated too. Because they went from the comfort of being slaves to the discomfort of being free. That paradigm is very close to where we are. Because the discomfort of being free is about up. And we are moving back into the comfort of being slaves. Do you understand what I mean by that? That's the choice that a lot of people are going to make. A lot of people are going to make the choice of wanting the comfort of slavery. Because it's encroaching upon us even now. This is part of the reset. And unless we are really walking with God, we won't understand it. And he did it again when Israel just acted an absolute fool in the land that God had brought them to. Can I keep talking to you? And he gave them some. They went in in for, uh, uh, 1447 B.C. Let's say 1500 B.C. to be clean. And they went into bondage in 587 B.C. They had 900 years to figure out how to be God's people. 900 years. 900 years to figure out how this reputation of God that is rooted in his identity, rooted in his characteristic, rooted in his reputation, which was a net that dragged them into it. Because what we're about to understand is that God's name was placed on them. Like his name is placed on us. And they didn't know how to live with the name of God. You guys understand what I'm saying? And then eventually they looked up and the Babylonians were there. Now God had already said it even before they came into the land. He said, now I'm letting you know how the covenant goes. You do the right thing. You never have to worry about a nation coming in. Don't do the right thing. They're coming. Remember two sides of God. Mercy and what? And then they look up and all of a sudden they're walking 800 miles from Beulah land to Babylon. That's Psalm 138. It lays it out. Right? It lays it out. Right? Singing the, how can we sing the songs of Zion in a strange land? We put our harps up on the willow trees and just wept. Because now they're recognizing a reset has occurred. Another reset has occurred. Another reset has occurred. I can tell you why. Because when God was working with them within the framework of their freedom, allowing waves here and waves there, they didn't know how to praise the Lord for his goodness, nor for his wonderful works to the children of men. Y'all understand? So we're in Psalm 107. The, the refrain in Psalm 107 is the imperative. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his wonderful works to the children of men. But that's Romans 1. Well, because they were unthankful, God gave them up. That's what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with a people in America who are unthankful. That, that's what we're dealing with. That's why another reset is about to occur. So, so mark the language here. He says here in verse 27, they reel to and fro and stagger like drunken men and are at their wits end. See, that's the only time you really call on God. When you come to the end of yourself. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble and he does what? Bring it them out of their distress. See, this the rhythm of redemptive relationship with God. Don't tell me God is not merciful, that he's not long-suffering, that he's not patient and kind and gentle. He's exactly what he said in, in, in Exodus 34, 5, isn't he? He's exactly that way. God will play the same record over and over, uh, over and over again until you can start singing in tune. 
you going to sing in tune. He going to fix those vocal cords. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his wonderful works, for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. Verse 32, verse 32. Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. You hear absolute massive jubilation. See, we're coming to the end of the psalm and they finally got it. Somebody was saying, hey, you need to worship God. He delivered you again. You need to worship God. He delivered you again. You need to worship God. He delivered you again. And now they're starting to do it because he's bringing them to their desired haven, which is what you see over in verse 30. Then are they glad because they be quiet. So he brings them unto their what? Yeah. He brings them to that rest. He brings them to that rest because God is faithful to get us there. That's the idea here under a celebration of his works in Psalm 107. Point number two, quickly to work through point number two, under the object of worship is God. We've seen under point number uh, one, uh, sub point A under point number two, reinforced by the angel again. We saw that in Revelation 22, 9, but look now at sub point B, established in all the scriptures. And the point being with that statement again is that worshiping of the one true and living God is not a sparse statement. This is the thing that runs through all the Bible. Deuteronomy 6, 4 is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. Him only shall you serve. That means worship. Right. That is the Shema of the Hebrew. And that is a that is an axiomatic primacy for the people of God in terms of of worship. And then Hebrews chapter uh, Hebrews chapter one, verse one lays out that as being something that we do in the totality of scripture. We were there before. Uh, you don't have to go there. And then uh, Psalm 47 lays it out too. look at Psalm 40, verse seven. This is a, a statement that we want to reiterate. And there are a couple of verses before and after that will anchor it down. Who's speaking here in Psalm 40, verse seven? Then said I, who's speaking? Jesus. You must know that. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. Verse eight. Now watch what it says. I delight to do thy will. Oh, my God. Is that true? Your law is within my heart. That makes Jesus the Ark of the Covenant. Because the Ark of the Covenant possessed the law of God. Remember? The, the law of God had the, uh, was in the Ark of the Covenant along with the manna. Who's the manna? Right. Uh, along with the rod of Aaron. Who's our great high priest? Right, so the Ark of the Covenant possesses within it the witness of God's mediating purpose to mankind. And Jesus sums all that up in himself. And he's letting you and me know this. Actually, let me contextualize what you're reading. What you're reading is coming directly from the mouth of the second Yahweh, the visible Yahweh. And it's coming from his mouth as he's standing in front of the congregation preaching. And this is why you read it all through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Christ going into the synagogue. Christ going into the temple. Christ going into the streets. This is being fulfilled, is it not? Now you got the picture, don't you? Beautiful thing. See, Jesus loves worship. And he loves being with his people because his people are the objects of the dragnet of God's reputation. We get drawn in. Look at verse Nine. Look at it. Watch this. I have preached righteousness where? In the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips. Oh, Lord, you know, I love this. So you can see the liberation of Christ in his proclamation of his father's glory, letting the people of God know who he is and how much God loves him and how much he loves God. Really? Really? Can y'all see that? Now watch this. This is the reason why they hated Jesus. Because Jesus gave the Father maximum glory in his life. Isn't that true? Jesus gave the Father maximum glory in his life. Jesus reminded the Jews that God made them and they didn't make God. He, he reminded them that they were made for God's glory. And he reminded them how that they should have actually worshipped God. How that they should have loved Torah and how that Torah should have pointed them to him. 
and how that he should have been celebrated as the presence of the father in the son. So for three and a half years, what Jesus did was every opportunity he could in the midst of worship was to manifest the father's glory. If he didn't preach the sermon, he healed somebody. And if he didn't heal somebody, he called somebody out of darkness and said, follow me. That's what he was doing that whole time. So three and a half years was an absolute stunning period of time for national Israel because Mashiach was among them. Yeshua was among them. The Lord was among them. The visible Yahweh was there magnifying all of the cardinal doctrines that describe God's nature and describes the people of God to them through Yahweh uh, the second person. Now notice what he says in verse 10. Psalm 40 verse 10. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. What that means is he didn't come to hide God's truth. He came to expose God's truth. Did he not? And he opened his mouth wide and he shared things with humanity that no man has ever done before. Unrivaled in the revelation of the Father to us. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the what? Now notice how he describes us as the great congregation. So now what you're doing as you and I are resonating on the what? Hashem, the name is we're understanding this character more fully and centrally in his son. And whether you know it or not, these qualities are moving ever closer to you and me. These qualities are moving ever closer to you and me. Sub point C in point number two. The object of God, of the worship of God is reinforced by the angel. It's established in the scriptures and it's comprehended in their what? Triune persons. Yeah, it's comprehended in their triune persons. John chapter 4, verse 24 and 25. Jesus explains this to the woman at the well this way. He said, God is what? Spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So right now we have the uh, ontological nature of God being revealed by the Son. And in this context, the Son is describing the Father. He's describing the father in terms of his ontological nature, not in terms of his communicable attributes that would be more personified. So when you and I are talking about spirit, we really don't know what we're talking about. All right, just be humble. I remember, I don't know who it was, Jonathan Edwards or, yeah, Jonathan Edwards humbled me. When he start explaining the phenomenology of spirit, which he was saying, I'm not explaining anything. I'm just using the pittance of human words to try to describe a dimension that is actually indescribable. You guys do agree with me? We're using terminology that is basically analogous to almost nothing of any referential equality. What I mean by that, as a reference to something else, how can you, how can you, how can you uh, analogize spirit? Like, we can say one thing is like something else, right? And we might be able to develop a relative approximation between the likeness and the reality. That's an analogy. You're not doing much with spirit. The further you go into explaining spirit, are you ready? The stupider you're going to get and the stupider you're going to sound. Uh, and I'm not going to go into all of the theology behind it, behind all these bright men who after reading them for about an hour, I get sleepy. And I'll tell you why. I get sleepy because I know all they're doing is compounding words and speculations that are interesting, but un, unable to continue to advance me into a deeper, more concrete understanding of spirit. Again, in theology, this is called tautology. You're building ideas around a bunch of words, but you actually aren't making any more advancement. Am I making some sense? Right, very important. And this is where humility comes in too, because you can be stupid enough to think you can explain God. And that's arrogance. 
The only thing you and I can do is declare what God has said about himself. Do you understand that? The only person that can explain God is God. And that's what Jesus did. Do you understand that? You can write that down. The only person that can explain God is God. Right. And this point is extremely important, and I love this too. So what I'm doing is what is called scriptural exposition, biblical teaching, not even really deeply exegetical because the scriptures are sufficient in terms of giving you clarity on topics. So you guys are benefiting because I'm going from verse to verse, allowing the verse to echo the, the subject that we're entertaining, right? And the spirit of God can take that and bless your soul. So I'm not like sitting up here for almost two hours, an hour and a half now, just running off at the mouth. We are anchored to the text. This is called biblical exposition. So you guys have had thus far 20 verses plus rendered into your hearing in relationship to the topics in their categories. And the spirit of God probably has blessed you with, uh-huh, that makes sense. Because that's what's required to be able to keep up with a brother for an hour and a half, right? And when God has taught you how to hear him through his word, you can do that. That's why I say you're privileged because there are people who can't even begin to sit that long and hear exposition of scripture without some preacher tap dancing and doing all kind of gymnastics to keep them emotionally attentive. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But there is something in us when we're born again that is enlarged by the spirit of God that hungers to know God at the level of propositional truth. And this is the communique of the Spirit of God who takes the speaker and takes the hearts and brings them into communion. That's what the proverb says. The preparation of the heart in man, your heart, and the answer of the tongue, mine, is from the Lord. So Lord, the Lord takes hearts and he takes a tongue and he speaks into our hearts. And we go away better than we came, right? That's a mystery. That's a mystery. The intellectuals don't understand this. They, they don't understand this. You, you have to be given access to this. And so this is what he means. God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Verse 5. Uh, verse 25, rather. 425. It goes on to say, The woman said unto him, I know that when Messiah comes, which is called Christ, which... When he comes, he will tell us all things. Verse 26. Let me see. Maybe I'm jumping. Okay. No, go back to verse 23. Verse 23. I just, one more verse. Ah, here it is. But the hour comes and now is when the what kind of worshipers? That's right. Now watch this. They shall worship the Father. Who is that? First person. Right? In the spirit. Right? Second person. And in the what? Third person. Second person. So you see the triune try formula there? So let me repeat that just so you, you can get it. The hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the first person in the third person according to the second person. Raise your hand if you got that because I need to keep going. All right, do not sleep. You see the triune formula there? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the true because Jesus is the precise inerrant equivalent revelation of the invisible God there is no distortion in his representation of God if he were distorted diminished altered lessened or increased in any of his revelatory capacity as the mediator of the invisible God he would not be the true did that make sense the thing that is representing must be absolutely equivalent to the thing it represents for it to be truth. And that's the nature of truth in our world. Truth is that which corresponds to its original design. This is the battle we are fighting in our culture right now around epistemology around reality this is what we're fighting right now around 
Epistemology is the, the, the idea of understanding or comprehending things. Epistemic, all right? Uh, stimmy means to stand, epi upon, to stand upon, to stand upon. So epistemology is your understanding of things. In our present world has utterly abandoned the epistemology of reality that God has given us by which we can begin to put together the analogy of the things made and the one who made them. Does that make sense? Right. So if God has given me a revelation of what is made and a revelation of who made it, now I have the tools for organizing a nomination or a set of ideas or propositions or a thesis, better stated, of how this world functions. So I can actually say in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I can say he made it for his glory. And I can say that the heavens declare the glory of God and the, the, the earth, his, his handiworks. And I can also say in Romans chapter 1 that the creation reveals God's eternal power in Godhead in such a vivid way, Romans chapter 1, 19, that we are totally without excuse. I can actually say that. I can say that if we look at creation through the proper lens, it will lead us to God. I can actually say that. And I can say that men have argued this from the beginning of time. And I can actually say that the Bible is adequate enough to give man a direction towards God via an explanation in the fundamentals of creation so that he becomes a believer in God, though, and therefore having a proper epistemological framework for reality a proper understanding of his world. Right. The moment that you and I reject biblical revelation, we are left to explaining the world ourselves and the other system that has replaced theological presuppositional epistemology is science. And what science has done it's actually borrowed from God the tools to excavate and told God to shut up. That's right. Because every accurate thing that science has done by which it has proven itself to be scientifically uh, uh, true, that is falsifiable and therefore uh, approved as being valid, has been because God has allowed it to occur, the coherency of reality to actually be discovered empirically under microscopes and much labor. And everything that they find, they can find within the framework of its matrix operational mode, but don't have the ability to determine its origin. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? I know I'm, I'm getting a little bit deep, but you guys went to college, y'all should know this in biology. So right, so what, what, what the scientist can do is work with what's there. It can't explain how it got there. But God already explained it. Right. Now, what they will say is, but that's not a scientific answer. Right. That's true. But neither is God did not create the heavens and the earth, a scientific answer. Do you understand what I just stated? That is a, that is a faith credo statement that has no basis in empirical evidence. So they're using faith as an argument against God. We're using faith as an argument for God. And so we are at an impasse. But what we know theologically is that until God grants them faith, they cannot affirm origin. And in that they can't affirm origin, they cannot determine teleos, outcome. Am I making some sense? I'm, I'm putting y'all to sleep now. Huh? I'm just going to sleep. 
Now, here's the reason why I would say this, and I'll, I'll stop here. Actually, even though I got 25 more minutes. Um, science. You re, how many of you guys came to our uh, Arts of Grace? Okay, good portion now. Do you remember my three brothers when they were marching doing this? Yeah. Huh? Do you remember that? Remember what they were saying? You're getting outside yourself, boy. You're getting outside yourself. That's what science is doing. <laughs> Getting outside itself. Right, because it's really making major leaps into speculative theories about the future as if it has the ability to be immutable in its, in its, in its speculations. Right? And, and we're impressed by a lot of what they're saying. I am. I enjoy scientific studies. Me and my children talk about it a lot because they're all into microbiology and, and all that kind of stuff. So we talk about artificial intelligence and, and you know, nanotechnology and a lot of stuff that's coming down. What they never understand is the plausible contingency of other factors thwarting their purposes. And they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't actually walk in that humility, they tell us what's going to happen. But, but God can bust that up anytime he wants to. Do you understand that? And he frequently does. This is a kind of kind of conversation I actually wanted to have with you guys on Sunday about the future. I'm still contemplating whether I want to do it or not. I wanted to talk to you guys about five questions that I'm working through. So I'll see how it goes on Sunday because, you know, if it doesn't appear that we are ready for a conversation about tomorrow, then I won't have it. Although I wish we could. I wish we could talk about publicly what tomorrow looks like and be free not to have to have an answer because what's going on in our world presently is designed to cause people to think certain ways and those certain ways are imposed upon people um, to their disadvantage when they don't have a, a context or a forum to work through all of the present factors driving the whole world in the direction that it's going. And you are left with mere social media chatter to work your way through it and, and not even be able to do that today in the context of freedom without being in danger of being identified and stigmatized for taking a certain position. Right, so what we must always know, children of God, please know this, you can act like you are not a product of the world, that would be a lie. And we should not do that. We are a product of the world. What that means is, is that while we've put on the best uh, persona we possibly can when we come together, and we should, we still struggle with everything else that everybody else in the world struggles with. And there is no panacea, there is no, no red pill to take in the church to just automatically escape. Our, our waking up is the consequence of a number of collaboratives that have to occur. Our emerging up out of the traps that are given to us as prefabricated visions, uh, uh, prepackaged uh, revelations. The way we wake up from that as the people of God is to be in a community where we can be genuine and safe to open up and talk about these matters with some deliberation that is thought through well so that right questions can be proffered and us to be able to air them and discuss them. I really do mean that. I, I really do mean that. That is an area of communion that the churches at large have not been able to do well, for which the year before COVID-19 and then COVID-19 has proven the church to be inadequate for handling this battle. And that's why most churches have fallen apart. 
They've fallen apart because they had a facade of unity, a facade of commitment to Christ, a facade of epistemological soundness that really wasn't there. And now they've been washed away and their communities don't know how to have the conversation. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Their communities don't know how to talk about history. They don't know how to talk about the present on political and social and psychological and domestic levels be because we've been playing uh, Disneyland church so long that we don't know how to explain the practical secular entrails that have always had their way in our lives. They've always had their way in our lives because we've seen the consequences of it. We just don't know how to talk about it. And, and, and as such, what most churches have been, which I'm partially that way, I'm not totally that way. This is why people get a little bit bothered with me. I am partially safe. Your pastor's partially safe and partially not. Do you know what I'm talking about? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Partially safe and partially not. In other words, I don't act as if I don't care with the people of God here. I try to be thoughtful and deliberate and prepared when I communicate to you. I really do. But I don't play the safe role of never talking about issues that, that are politically incorrect. I don't do that. We're going to talk about it. And so I try to get out in front of it and deal with it, but I try to use some safety margins when I recognize that people are uncomfortable. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Well, I can tell you this. Since you guys are, are centered in hearing me because we're coming up out of a, a worship mode, which is helpful because what worship does to me, to me, worship gives me the capacity to comprehend everything. That's me. Like, I believe that what worship is designed to do is raise your level of consciousness. To be able to at least entertain subject matters that are difficult. Because the objectivity that comes with a proper uh, 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 focus on God, with the objectivity that comes with that, you can lay out a subject matter in front of the worshiper and the worshiper does not feel compelled to completely commit himself to it or completely reject it because he's not in a position, a healthy enough position objectively to consider what's being said. Get, I'll give you an example now that I got you. Homosexuality. The church struggled enormously over the last 50, 60, 70 years with homosexuality. 80, 90 years. Are you hearing me? And so therefore, homosexuality had to come in through the door of political policy to make it visible and problematize it in the community. So by the time the church had to deal with it, it was already reinforced by legal rights. I'm going to show you what happens right here. So I'm giving you a little bit, I'm giving you guys some lessons on the diabolical nature of politics that we have to make sure that we don't succumb to. So the nature of politics, the nature of it is division. The nature of politics is division. It, it can only work by dividing people in order to advance its cause because in the, hear me, in the division where there's a vote, it only requires one more vote than 50%. Watch the logic. Watch the logic. So if we were all voting in this room on a majority rule for any position and one vote tips us over to that position, we disappoint 49% of the rest of the people automatically. Are you guys listening to me? I'm going to show you how much trouble the church is in. That dialectical process teaches us to practice living with division. And then it teaches us to 
become comfortable with division that will press deeply down into our lives depending on what kind of subject it is. This is why the homosexual thing was a problem that we could kind of contain if you had a policy of silence, whether it was on the job or whether it was in the military or whether it was even in your homes. You just don't talk about it. Am I, am I making some sense? But once, you, once it's politicized, now the family is in a heated debate. And that's called intentional conflict. That's designed to pit two people against each other because science knows you're not going to get everybody on the same page. So if you set up a game theory of politics, right, left, you create a context for division because if people are free to choose sides, one is going to choose the right, the other is going to choose the left. And depending on how those people behave after their choices, predicated upon the rewards given to either the winner or the loser, are you ready? It exacerbates the division. It exacerbates the division. And once you have a policy as encroaching as racism and melanin distinction and historic grievance, you know, condemnation of ethnic groups, you have masterfully split the church in half. Masterfully. Am I making sense? masterfully split, split the church in half, masterfully set people up to now go, I'm right, they're wrong. I'm right, they're wrong. Without a solution. Like there's no solution to politics. So I'm hoping that you wake up, listen to me. So what you have experienced all the days of your life in America, what you have experienced is an experimentation in division predicated upon a democratic process that has not taught you how to act in character to deal with differences with the goal of coming into a harmonious conclusion that betters everybody. Am I making some sense? Am I making some sense? Right, so we've been trained that this is a zero-sum game, that this is a battle for a position, that if you lose, they, the winner takes all. That is not how you build unity in any society. That's not how you build it in the family. That's not how God's church, that's why God's church is not a democratic setup. That's why we don't vote. Do you hear me? That's why we don't vote. In wise churches, do you better not vote. You better hear what God's word says, pray about unity, and just walk in that truth. You can put the burden of the decision on leadership and pray for leadership. And keep walking in truth. Once you and I are given the power of the vote, it's over with. And this is why our country is falling apart as we speak because it doesn't have a solution to its disagreement. And that has taken place in the church as well. It's very important for you and I to know. So, cause this is like, you know, for a season the left is winning, like they are right now. And it's really a tragic thing because the left today is not what the left was 30 years ago. And for a season, the right was winning. And really, it's tragic because what the right was a few years ago was not what the right was 50 years ago. So you have a left-right swing. This is your perilous pendulum. I taught you this, right? The Hegelian dialectic within the framework of the, the pump cart plantation paradigm going in the same direction. Temporary opposition. But once you put subject matter in there that's volatile inflammatory you blow everybody up so see we have been pushed to extremes now we have been pushed to extremes 
extremes on your right. You better know the right right now are planning just like the left did to act a fool. You must know that. This is the science of politics, right? For every, for every action, there's an equal and what? Opposite reaction. You have to know that. That's how the enemy diabolically divides. There in politics, there is no let the two come together, put the facts on the table, let's reason through these things and find out what the best solutions are and let us all understand what the most optimal and most advantageous and proper solution for our society should be. We don't have that mechanism in politics. So politics is designed to destroy our nation and bring us to extremes and now we must be rescued. We must be rescued by a tyrannical power that will control us and tell us how we to live because we don't know how to live free. You do understand what I'm saying. That's where we're headed. That's, in fact, all of the infrastructure is there. So what it, here's the theological framework to this. You can read it for yourself in Isaiah chapter 3. This is called the takeaway principle. If you've never seen it before, pull up Isaiah 3 for me, Akila. I'm going to show you how this looks. I'm going to show you how America looks right now. I've been through this text before, but I want you to see how it looks. And, and what God is saying is the reason why you can no longer be free is because you're not mature enough to walk in your freedom. Remember, that's what I was saying. Like Israel was delivered from bondage, and then in the wilderness, they kept acting the fool. Free as could be, kept acting the fool. Then God killed up all the old people, and then took the young people and put them in the land. So now look, I want you to remember, you didn't pay for this. I paid for this. Don't act like you own this. And if you don't, <laughs> if you, if you don't give me my glory, you're going to be out in a minute. Sure enough, they were out. Right? Listen to how God explains the condition of America and our churches when we fail to mature, which is my message around faith. Actually, what I'm, what I'm doing right now in my teachings on faith for us, what I'm trying to do is show us how the way that the church is going to survive what's coming is through right character. Here's going to be my argument. That character has gotten us into the mess that we're in. Bad character. Bad character has gotten us into the mess that we're in. And only good character is going to get us out. That's my argument. I'm going to show you how that's Peter's instruction to us in what he saw was the reset of the first century. He's telling us how we need to be once the whole thing falls apart and it was going to fall apart in Peter's day in three years. Do you understand what I just stated? If you've been following me in the Revelation, you know it. Total destruction of Israel. Total disintegration of the Roman Empire. Total reset. And Christians were prepared because of character to be able to facilitate a recovery of civilization over a long period of tribulation. Understand what I just stated? So I, before I read this, here's the opposite, because I, I know we don't get it. So, you know, stupid people will say, well, why is Jesus telling the disciples, don't you do an eye for an eye? Don't you do a two for two? Don't you do a life for a life? Don't you render unto evil evil? Don't you do that? That is what you get back. If you want to survive as a community, you cannot operate out of those methods. The problem is, in that game, the price annies up until everybody's wiped out. Raise your hand if you're tracking with me so far. Good. Here's the reason why. You can know this. We have been on the brink of destruction as a humanity for many decades now. Since the game of war has increased to the level of nuclear exchange. You guys hear what I'm saying? 
and, and because we're deluded into thinking that life is automatically given to go on without any major le legitimate conflagrations that can utterly, utterly change our whole worldview, we're, we're, we're oblivious. Do you understand that? We're utterly oblivious to the tangential nature of the possibility of a complete change of the landscape of our world because we have amped up the power game to its highest level. Am I making sense? It's, and we've been living with that game ramped up. The arms race hasn't completely eradicated the possibility of somebody acting a fool and then that chain reaction taking place around the world. You know that. On top of that, I got you for a few more minutes. What you are experiencing right now is biological warfare. Do your own research. Do your own research. Biological warfare goes all the way back to the Roman Empire. It goes all the way back to the Persian Empire. It goes all the way back to the Babylonians. They've been talking biological warfare since the beginning of wars. And because we are in the scientific era, we're in that era. We've been in that era for a long time. Take science, which can manipulate the stoike of the universe, and take unregenerate men. And tell me what, what formula you have there other than destruction. Hear me now, and therefore I know that you and I are living under the umbrella of grace. Like grace is restraining humanity, restraining men. Would you agree? Right, but, but we are and have been for a long time under existential threat. Right. This is why I shared with you the resets I did all the way up to the first century. I could go into the resets throughout the uh, 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 Anno Domino age, first century reset, fifth century reset, first millennium reset, the 12th century reset, the 13th century reset. We've been going through resets in our world all through our history. Are you guys hearing me? Yeah. World War I, World War II. Major resets. Now, see, the reason why what I'm talking about is alien to us, because the vast majority of us have been living a Disneyland life for the majority of our life. This is not true for Christians in war-torn countries. This is not true for Christians in countries where ecologically things are so extreme that poverty and crime is a daily common parlance. This is why I know we Christians in America are completely incapable of dealing with any major catastrophes. And this is why I also know that this particular warfare that was unleashed on us according to Revelation 6 in terms of this biological trial was God's mercy. Can I speak to it? Right. This is how I know. Like, you can't control viral activity when it's unleashed in the wild. You can't tell whether or not it's going to magnify and do what it did in the era of the Black Plague, Spanish flu, and many, many eras in which viruses just completely wiped out tens of millions of people. Because you can't, you can't tell what it will do. Are you hearing me? You can't tell what it will do. Why God let that happen, we don't know, but we can't tell what it will do. All we can do, and this is the conversation really that I wanted to have, so it'll be recorded if people wanted to listen to it, because I want us to be more sober this time around. Because God was gracious with this SARS virus. COVID is a symptom. SARS is the virus. COVID is not a virus. It's just symptoms. You need to study a little bit more. You do understand COVID is symptoms. All right, inflammation, upper or lower respiratory diseases, all those are called symptoms. We've always had those symptoms. Do you understand that? We've always had symptoms like that and people have died from them and recovered, like lots of people are recovering now 
from the symptoms because it's nothing but symptoms. The SARS has always been around. You understand that? We all know that. Only this particular one, controversially, it's my opinion, and it's based upon a lot of different scientific estimations, was designed to be an experimentation in our world for the implementation of things that you and I are already experiencing that were already prepared to take place when this happened. They were so confident that it was going to happen that they told us before it happened that it would happen. That's how confident they were. Are you guys hearing? Yeah. Secondly, they are so confident that that would happen that they are saying another one will occur too. Right. So, I'm, you know, like, I'm glad you're listening because you know what I know about Christians? They're not paying attention. I know that Christians are not paying attention. Somehow what we're thinking is if we get involved and super entangled in trying to actually fear it through and organize these, the, the, the chatter about everything, that somehow we're going to get lost in it. The problem is if you don't get enough clarity on it, you don't have the circumspection you need to be positioned to deal with it when it comes again. And then you'll act like, where did that come from? And a lot of us will know, we told you that it was coming again. All right, so this one here was designed to wipe out tens of millions of people, this particular SARS virus, according to their metrics. According to their metrics, this was to wipe out tens of millions. They had it all laid out. You can... I, Anybody listen to me on Monday? Because I, I try to tell it on Monday. I try not to preach it much here. I, t I talk about it on Monday. The facts are there. Anybody want to learn? They can. They were utterly surprised that this virus spiraled down and not up. Can I tell you why it spiraled down? Because of him who sits on the throne. Because of him who sits on the throne. I'm a theist. I believe in God. Yes, sir. It didn't spiral down by any plan, ingenuity, or methodology on man's part. It spiraled down to where it does not kill us as expected. Because God's showing mercy still. Trying to wake his people up. Showing mercy, that's what he does. Right? To show mercy. But when I look at history, because I've, I've seen history, I've seen God destroy countries. Christians live in those countries. Christians live in those countries that he destroyed. Do you understand me? I think about all of the crazy plagues and crazy diseases, some man-made in military excavations, wiping out tribes and wiping out lesser countries, the Philippines and, and parts of Africa, poor Africa. Don't even let me get started. And you don't, you don't know it if you don't do the research. We have a history of destruction, but that's revelation. That's the four horsemen. Wars and pestilence and famines and death. Y'all do know your Bible, right? All you got to do is ask when you read the language of the analogy of the horses riding, what does that look like in real time, Lord? Now, I shared this with you when I was unpacking the revelation. You got to know that Christ is ruling all of this. You actually have to know he's ruling all of this. That's what the revelation depicts. He's on the throne controlling war, controlling pestilence, controlling famine, controlling death. My Lord is controlling that. Right. So I have to actually negotiate what I'm going through from the premise of his sovereignty. At least that frees me up from the unbearable notion that nobody's in control. Let alone maniacal men and institutions and, and, and demonic systems. They are there. We can, we can identify many of them. But they've always been there. The world's been at war since the devil crawled up and talked to our mama and our daddy. Do you understand that? Yes. It's been at war. So the issue for the believer is this. How do we prepare for these atrocities going in and coming out? Doesn't that make sense? And if we don't talk about it, I can tell you that's a disadvantage for the people of God. Like when you are not willing to face 
the contingency, the possibilities, when you're not willing to work through plausible uh, options and, 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 and logical preparation formats for dealing with struggles and challenges, when you're not willing to work through that, what I know is the, the adversary who hates order, who hates civility, who hates society, loves us kind of people because we are careless. Wish I had time. Book of Judges. It's a period in the Judges where there was a whole society right near the Benjamites who lived freely and carelessly. And the Benjamites were warrior tribes who had become somewhat perverted. And they recognized this group of people that were free and careless and they were easily able to go in there and enslave them and destroy many of them. Because in this world of fallenness, you can't be free and careless. If you're going to be free, you got to be careful. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? To be free, you have to be careful. You have to be vigilant. You have to be watchful. Also, you have to be knowledgeable. So here's, yes. So here's what Peter is helping us do. And I'm, I'm really hoping we get it because I just, I don't know. I'm just looking at the patterns. I say to myself, if another virus emerges out of nowhere, that's a contradiction in logic for me. You know I know better than that. Uh, with a more significant capacity to destroy life, humanity is already preconditioned particularly first world countries like ours, to do only in everything our government says. Am I making sense? Because we're being trained right now to do only in everything that they say. Now, the reason why is because we're not free to talk about different options. People are not allowed to say there are different ways of dealing with these problems. Although there are. Although there are. There are many different ways. In fact, if we had dealt with it differently beforehand, we wouldn't even be having a conversation. Many of us know. Early treatment would have even stopped all of this junk that was going on. Early treatment. Did you guys hear what I just stated? But because early treatment was delayed, it allowed people to get toxically sick. And being toxically sick, it pushed them over the top. And so we have some quite controversial numbers of deaths. They say 500,000. I don't believe it. I have tons of arguments against those numbers. But nevertheless, the mercy of God in us not experiencing some massive bubonic plague-like catastrophe just renders my heart absolutely gratuitously happy to God for no reason. There's no reason he, there's no reason in my mind that he had to let that happen. That he minimized the virus's mutation because it's mutating while we speak. That's what they do. Sorry, talk to any immunologist, talk to any Biologists, they, do, they know that, okay? Which brings into question the efficacy of the vaccines. I'm sorry. I'm just telling you logic. If you know anything, you just know, okay, we're dealing with a bunch of irrational crap going on right now. And that's, that indicates that our government just thinks Americans are stupid. And we're not. That's why I showed you that film on Tuesday of people on the ground who are smart enough to know better. It's just our representatives don't represent us. Am I making some sense? However, what you and I are dealing with is what has been, I've been teaching for years is called the takeaway. Right? To whom much is given, much is what? To him that hath, more shall be given. But to him that hath not, even that which he seems to have. So listen to Isaiah and tell me, does this not sound like our country? For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth what? Take away. From Jerusalem and Judah, the stay and the staff. Now that's uh, that's our.
physical resources, a metaphor for our physical resources. It can be everything from bread to the stability of our homes, okay? Stay in staff. And then he says, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. Bread and water are the staples of life. Notice what he's saying. I'm taking that away. That doesn't bother you and me because we live in a technologically advanced culture where we've never ever thought about having to walk for miles to find water. Am I telling the truth? In our third world countries, they know exactly what this means. Verse 2. Verse 2. The mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet and the prudent and the ancient, what happened to them? Taken away. See, taken away is the verb that modifies every one of these, every one of these terms. The mighty man is gone. That's the man of war. The judge is gone. The prophet, the prudent. Ladies and gentlemen, when you don't have mighty men, when you don't have judges, when you don't have prophets, when you don't have prudent men, when you don't have senior, aged, wise men, your country is in trouble. These occupy the positions of safety and security in your land. They occupy positions of safety and security. You don't want a country where you don't have men of war. You don't want a country where you don't have godly judges and, and prophets that can speak into society for God. You don't want a society where, like our government said just two weeks ago, the will of God has no place in this Congress. That's what they said. How many of you guys heard that? At least one or two. I say, I pay attention. Because I understand that the warfare is in our government. Satan operates within principalities and powers and dominions in the authority realm. That's where he works because he can get policies that can constrain the believer. And when you've got politicians that can stand up and, and vocalize literally in Congress, the will of God does not matter here. You got the takeaway going on. Do you understand that? We're in a takeaway. They don't even fear God, right? Verse three, the captain of 50 and the honorable man and the counselor and the cunning artificer and the eloquent orator. These are all the uh, paraphernalia of people that not only maintain the integrity of the infrastructure of your country, but the beauty of it. So don't, don't miss the point of the uh, cunning artificer. Because think about the cunning artificer is your artist who makes stately buildings and stately uh, 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 facilities and, and carves out landscapes that are designed to create beauty. That's a gift from God. Think about when you lose the beauty and now all you have is iron curtain or cement walls, which is a communist framework and a socialist, empty-headed, non-optimistic vision of cold steel. I'm trying to press them home. So this is why we did our Arts of Grace, too, because I know we don't get it. Art is a gift from God. You don't play down music. You don't play down drama. You don't play down art because God has employed all of them all through the scriptures. Yes, he has. He opened up his Bible as an artificer of creation. You read Genesis 1 and 2, and it's eloquent and beautiful. The first thing that God is showing you is beauty. Am I making some sense? Beauty and eloquence and splendor. The rhythm of Genesis 1 and 2 is symmetrically musical. God did this on day one, and day one had this. God did this on day two, and day two had this. All of that is terse language to give you a beauty of rhythm and splendor. And then God being happy that he did it, which tells you and me that we should be embracing beauty and embracing art and embracing those qualities that some of us don't have and others of us do to make life much fuller. Am I making sense? And when God takes wisdom away from men, he also takes beauty away from them. 
He takes the capacity for them to imagine and for them to be able to, ex to, to visualize things that can actually cause us to appreciate visually, audibly, sensibly the glory of God because we're created in the Imago Dei. Verse four. Oh, go back. In the, go back. Here's the latter part. The eloquent orator. Come on now. This is so important. I, I, I shouldn't do this. I should stop. But here's, here's the importance. Here's the importance. So this is God's word. He's showing you how he understands humanity and how men and women are moved to obey him through the eloquence of preaching. Do you understand that? The eloquence of preaching. And this is when countries have great leaders who are able to put it together and articulate it in deeply thoughtful phrases and terms at length in their presentations, the whole nation is brought together as one. Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? So Martin Luther King was one of those men, whether you know it or not, regardless of his politics or his religious failings, I can tell you that now. The eloquence with which he spoke demanded people listen. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and listen. Because you don't hear men communicating with that kind of depth and thought and cadence and power and substance for which it got him killed. Which is what happens to the prophets and happened to our master. Because a prophet is called to be eloquent as well as poignant and careful. And so when you have statesmen that can speak well, and you can go back in your own time in history and you can hear them. You can go online and hear them. These are, these are men who could speak to millions of people. Yes, it can be used for evil because Hitler did the same thing. But that was because they were already preconditioned to hate God. By the way, Satan is probably one of the most eloquent speakers on the planet. It doesn't change the fact that God's servants should be deep, thoughtful, profoundly uh, clear and persuasive communicators to help men and women get on the same page. And you can hear it when you hear wise people. Am I making sense? When you hear wise people, they, there's all kind of wise people around the world. I wish you could just listen to them all day because you get better when you listen to wise people. You do not get better when you listen to stupid people. You do not get better. You devolve down. He that will be wise must dwell with wise people. If you want to have the ability to think broad, think deeply, think coherently, think rationally, think logically, think biblically, you got to listen to people that are gifted and, 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 and wrought with conviction and experience. There's nothing better than that kind of experience in your life. Your life is not shaped by anything but words. That's what our lives are shaped by. They're not shaped by entertainment is truth proclaimed watch this verse 4 follow this through I will give children to be their princes is that where we are see the term children you know what that means immature I am I need to stop my heart breaks for the man that occupies the White House right now my heart breaks my heart breaks for him I'm not being facetious and I am not a scorner. My heart breaks for Biden because he has no capacity. He has no capacity. He's a broken man. Do you guys understand that? If, if please be careful how you view him. He can't do anything. He can't do anything. I, unfortunately, I caught him off script. And he asked Nancy, he just talked to her, he called her Nancy. Is this what you want me to say, Nancy? Just, is this what you want me to say? I'm like, that's sad. That's sad. Because it's a facade in our faces and we're supposed to buy it as if somehow that's security. That is not security. That's not security. And for how did we get here? We have to think about how we got here. 
Do you guys understand what I'm saying? How, how do we get to a place where we're thinking it's okay for a man to occupy the most powerful position in the world and he has to get permission to speak freely? He asked her, can I just talk to the people? And you know what she did? She looked around and she didn't even know how to say no because it was embarrassing to her. But she didn't want him to speak off script. My heart breaks. How do you, how do you have a government like that? Listen, ladies and gentlemen. To even reach those echelons of, of authority, you have to be people who have certain levels of knowledge. They're not blind to that. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can't be in Congress. You can't be a senator. You can't be a governor. You can't be in politics and not have that kind of uh, social awareness. You, you know the incompetency is massive. And yet our politics got us there. And so we gonna, we're going to suffer the consequences of that for sure. I will give children to be their princes and babes shall rule over them. So the administration that's in has plopped down upon us a record uh, of, of, uh, of executive artists like we've never heard before in our life. And now we've got policies that we're facing that's going to direct us, uh, that's going to impact us directly. And we're going to be facing crazy Crazy ideas around biology and around gender. Crazy stuff that we shouldn't even be talking about. And he was eager to pass it on. I'm like, man, I, do you want to be known for the one who just utterly ruined the greatest nation in the world? Because I can tell you, if you read Ezekiel chapter 20, God says, I gave them bad doctrine, which ruined that nation. OK, bad doctrine will ruin a nation. So when he gives you over, he gives you over to reprobate mind and you make choices. That, that's what I'm going to talk about on Sunday. So look. So what God says to us as he's speaking through Peter is you and I have to be. Uh, we have to be people of virtue. Because right thinking. Right character leads to right thinking. And right thinking leads to right choices. And right choices lead to right outcomes. Okay? Right character leads to right thinking. Right thinking leads to right choices. And right choices lead to right outcomes. Like, that's axiomatic. That's not an option. You and I already know we can wreck our lives by not thinking right. And if we're not thinking right, it's because our character is flawed. Decision-making requires men and women to be committed to virtue. Am I making sense? Now watch this, because see, this is scandalous. But here's God's solution to a society of people who are living in the downgrade. Uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon called this the downgrade, when our society devolves. What is the answer to a devolving society? An evolving people. What is the answer to people that are devolving? People who are regenerating. What's the answer to people that are going down? People that are going up. What's the answer that, to people who are becoming myopic? People who are being, becoming broad in their capacity to comprehend the landscape. What's the answer to reprobation? The answer to reprobation is a regenerate mind that's able to think God's thoughts after him. What's the answer to a culture of corruption and chaos? The answer is a society of men and women who walk in order and in clarity, who are committed to principle and righteousness. The answer to a broken world, a ruined world, are redeemed people. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? The answer to our world is not, we're going to beat them next time. The answer to our world is raising our kids to be wise men and women in Christ. This is where I'm going when I talk to us. Because the answer is not sticking your head in the sand and hoping Jesus comes. That is not the answer. Do you hear me? That is not the answer. Jesus is coming. 
But that's not the answer. The answer is not leaving your kids a legacy and a way out. The answer is showing them the path out. So when you and I are gone, they can take up the mantle of character that leads to good conduct, that leads to right choices, that leads to right outcome so that they can recover the Imago day in this crazy world. Am I making some sense? It's really true. It's really true. Three more things. I'm going to tell you the story behind why I made that statement and then I'm going to close. I will give children to be their princes and babes shall rule over them. That's immature men and women who don't qualify to rule. Now, you wouldn't let a child fly an airplane. Verse 5. And the people shall be oppressed. Got it? Oppression comes when authority is incompetent. Right, this is the logic behind oppression when authority is incompetent. And I want you to get this, this applies to parents too, watch this. Like, when your kids are starting to grow up, parents, and they are becoming <laughs> intellectually complicated, they're simply challenging you to keep growing. You guys got what I just stated? And if you don't keep growing, the only thing you can do to contain them is apply force. The best thing you and I can do is keep growing with our kids. You guys hear what I just stated? Right, so this, in our governments, our government, when they don't wanna to have to explain themselves and bring clarity because people on the ground are smart, they just exercise force. It's called oppression. This is what I've said for years, it's called pulling rank. Well, just do what I say, because I said so. Well, we're done with the democracy at that point. And particularly a representative republic, we don't have one. Because let, let's say the people on the ground are, are intuitive and thoughtful and investigatory and open for dialogue, but our leaders are drunken sailors. They don't want to have a conversation with us because they will discover that we know more than them. Would you agree? And don't nobody want to have the conversation in, in Sacramento that says, you know what, can we do a test? Can we have y'all, everybody in Sacramento, go on vacation for just one month? And let's just, let us pick people that we think are competent enough to occupy your seats and do an experiment for a month. Let them legislate policy, let them execute policy. And let's see whether or not we can actually turn this ship around in no time flat. They would never do it. Are you hearing me? Yeah. All right, so watch this. And the people shall be oppressed, everyone by another. And, and uh, I tell you, this thing that's happening now is part of that kind of oppression paradigm. Right, and, and, and this is where they're starting to develop jobs for tracking, so that if you don't comply with COVID, you get fined. Because people are going to get paid to track you. If you don't believe it, do the research. It's already happening in already other countries, right? These are tracking jobs. Keep, keep up with people. That's oppressive in a free country. Everyone by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient. If, if that's not what's going on, I don't know what is. And the base against the honorable. See it? how things are turned upside down? Verse 6. When a man shall take hold of his brother of the house of his father, saying, you have clothing, be our ruler. This is what we call metaphorically the empty suit. You got it? Yeah. Oh, man, you got a blue suit? You be our president. I got a red tie. And let this ruin be unto your hand. I'm telling you, it's closer to reality than you think. Verse 7. In that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be a healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. Man, I'm broke. Don't, 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 don't put me in there. Where are you going to pay me to do this for you? A healer is a metaphor for a good ruler. You guys got that? Good rulers are healers. This dude's saying, you got to pay me. That's how you know he's an empty suit. He's concerned about bread in his own house instead of the welfare of the society. He doesn't know 
that if he has the gift of healing, God will take care of him. Do you understand what I just stated? He doesn't know that spiritual gifts invariably produce material economic remuneration. Do you guys understand what I just stated? It's very true. You can't outgive God. And when you occupy the role of God and you bless God's people, it's coming back. The servant of the Lord never has to worry about God taking care of him. But if he's a harl if he's a charlatan, he got to get paid first. These are the special interest groups in Washington. Here it is. Verse 8. For Jerusalem is what? And Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke his eyes, the eyes of his glory. Do you see that? His own people are speaking against him. His own people. Verse 9. Two more verses, saints. They show the show of their continence doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as what? They do not hide it. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. See it? Verse 10. Say ye not, say ye to the righteous, though, it shall what? For they shall eat the fruit of their doings. I wish we could get that. I wish we could get that. I wish we could get how that God is once again protecting the righteous in the midst of that storm. Do you see that? He's doing the same thing he did in Egypt. He's telling the righteous, don't you compromise. I will take care of you. Even though you see all the evil going around, don't compromise. Tell the righteous, and that's a beautiful thing. Tell the righteous, it will be well with them. Beautiful. Don't have to compromise. Verse 11. Woe unto the wicked. It will be ill with him. For the reward of his hand shall be given him. So you got to tell the wicked that. In verse 12. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the gospel. Do you understand that? Destroy the good news of deliverance, which is through Christ Jesus our Lord, getting humanity back on a right path. They destroy that. They make it impossible to get back to God. That's where we are and that's where we're going. All of the policies are destruction policies. None of them are building up. So how does the believer function in this world under those kinds of terms? That's what we're working through. And I suggest to you that Peter has given us the, the answer. Add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. Add to your faith characteristics that tell men and women that you're serious about God and that God grants you the ability to have the kind of wisdom rooted in your character to be able to find our way out of this crazy this is how we've gotten to the year 2000. We've made it to the year 2000 because God has always had a people that he has preserved for his glory that have been able to make it through all these resets. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? All these resets up to now, all these resets, when it falls apart, the only people they're going to be able to look to are people who are rooted and grounded and clear on how God's world really works. And you and I ought to be those kind of people who know how the world should really work. All right, let me close this in prayer. Thank you for your patience. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the warning. Thank you for uh, expanding our thought processes, given the days to come. Uh, give us boldness to be able to freely talk about it and to freely engage our thoughts and try to figure out ways in which to be... Um, a witness, a witness.
to your wisdom and power which is in Christ so that we can be the kind of citizens should you leave us here and not return that can do exactly what first and second Peter has called us to be the kind of men and women um, whose chase conversation leads people to ask us of the hope of the calling that is within us with meekness and fear. Give us traveling mercies now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's get out of here and go home. I, you guys, uh, I owe y'all a donut. <laughs>